Good afternoon. You all know me better than that one more time. Good afternoon. That's more like it. Thank you to this afternoon's program participants and to my staff, interns, and volunteers, without which today would not have been possible. More than a year ago, 500 residents of this district joined me as I was sworn in as your city council member. Thank you to those of you who were there then, those of you who are here today, and all of you who have been there all along the way. Since that time, one year, one month, eight days later, much has been accomplished. My team and I have been honored to assist more than 1,000 residents with problems ranging from potholes to evictions. As chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations, I've chaired 14 hearings, passed seven bills, and two resolutions through the committee. I'm proud to stand before you as a lawmaker who has passed two resolutions and four bills into law. I've held 20 First Fridays, policy nights, and attended over 100 community meetings. I've secured $35 million for the East River Esplanade and distributed $2.7 million in participatory budgeting. With two years, 10 months, 19 days, 10 hours, 30 minutes, and roughly 40 seconds left, we've got so much more to get done and precious little time. Democracy depends on government that is transparent, open, and accountable, that empowers residents to have the information, access, and ability to play a meaningful role in the decision-making process. These are your streets, your parks, your light, your air, and your city. If it wasn't clear already, this office belongs to you, and it is open to you. On the first Friday of every month from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., residents are welcome to join me in the office to discuss issues that matter to them. Attendance varies from a high of 50 to an average of 10 or 20. But I hold them each month because of how important it is to open government to provide a chance for residents to meet me face to face. Democracy only works with your participation. Thank you to residents like Mel Lyman, Elizabeth Ryman, and Carol Hughes, who have been there each month and inspire me to keep going. For those who join us at First Fridays, you may know that if anyone has a good idea for policy or legislation, they get invited to policy nights to mobilize people who want to create change. With such precious little time to get so much done, the only way to get more done than I otherwise could alone is to empower residents with the tools and support they need from my office to help advocate for and set policy. Ms. Lorraine Brown, who did a beautiful reading of Still I Rise, has been working with me to close the digital divide in public housing, a project that came from Policy Night. Ms. Myrna LeBeau, concerned for mental health of public school students following acts of violence in schools, far too many to name, advocated for more school counselors, and I was proud to sponsor legislation that became law requiring reporting by the Department of Education. I've hosted monthly forums on topics from safer streets to emergency preparedness so you can speak directly to city agencies. But opening my office wasn't enough. I've decided to be even more proactive to come to you. I launched a mobile office where my social work team goes into the community with hours at Stanley Isaacs uh, and Holmes Towers, Robbins Plaza and Lenox Hill, and Roosevelt Island. If you know of a community that needs my help with a location to host us, please let me know so we can expand our services. In order to make it even easier, I launched Ben in Your Building, where I'll come to your home if you can organize 10 neighbors uh, whenever is most convenient to you. Since then, I've had the pleasure of meeting with condo and cooperative boards, tenants associations, and concerned citizens in their apartments to learn from them and their neighborhoods what's most important. I've also decided to give you $1 million through participatory budgeting, which allows you to propose projects and vote directly on how your tax dollars get spent. Last year, the community voted to bring us bus countdown clocks to the downtown M31 and Crosstown buses, and improvements to NYCHA, including accessibility, new appliances, gardens, and security. 
most people do not know what a council member does. Uh, some council members don't even know what council members do. <laughs> so I started an education campaign, visiting street fairs in the district to talk to you about how my office can help. Through outreach like this, I've been able to discuss with you many of the issues of importance to you and your families. Issues that I plan to address today, like the Marine Transfer Station, open spaces, safer streets, education, affordable housing, and sustainable development. The top issue in the district remains the ill-conceived Marine Transfer Station, a garbage dump in a residential neighborhood. I grew up across the street from it when it was active, have been a member of Asphalt Green, and ran for office in large part so I could help fight it. In my first months in office, I worked with Pledge to Protect, who tabled outside the event today, so thank you for that, to reframe the narrative. Rather than fighting over where to spread harm, we advocated for investing in our future. Reduce, reuse, recycle. According to Pledge to Protect, Talking Trash Report, we have 22,056 residents, 1,059 children, 6,755 minority residents, 1,173 units of public housing, and six schools near this one station, more than all six other stations combined. If the sandy flooding of the FDR wasn't enough, we showed that the station was being built in a floodplain. We could save $93 million a year if we went from recycling just 15% to the Los Angeles rate of 45%. You can take the pledge and read the report at pledge, the number two, protectnyc.org. This year, we built a coalition with activists from Brooklyn who are also facing marine transportation in their residential communities. All summer, we held rallies in front of Asphalt Green, elderly residents and activists like Joan Kavanaugh, Barbara Hyman, and Lorraine Johnson got arrested for the first time in their lives. <laughs> During budget hearings, I exposed the fact that the estimated capital costs for the station quintupled since the project began, jumping from $44 million to $215 million. I commissioned a report from the Independent Budget Office that showed that it will cost New Yorkers three times as much to dispose of trash through the Marine Transfer Station than the current system of sending our trash to New Jersey. With $600 million, that's two-thirds of a billion, over the next 20 years. I've used this information to call on the administration to stop this Marine Transfer Station for the good of all New Yorkers. I support the proposal to move the ramp away from the center of asphalt greens fields, but I remain ever vigilant and hopeful that logic, reason, and fact will win over politics and that the dump can finally be stopped. <laughs> the DEC will soon be opening a public information session to gather information from everyone in the community about air quality. And so when that happens, I'm counting on every single one of you, all of your neighbors, everybody you know all over the city to speak up, speak out, and explain why the neighborhood with some of the worst air quality in the city should not be getting a dump in, its, in the middle of a neighborhood and a children's playground. As I run or walk along the East River Esplanade and through Carl Scherz Park, so many of you have stopped me to share the importance of open space and revitalizing our waterways. When Rockefeller University announced it would be expanding their campus over the FDR as part of a deal from a generation ago, I was pleased to follow the community board and Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer in working with President Mark Tessier Levine to provide millions to support infrastructure and a redesign with a first of its kind million dollar trust to maintain their area of the waterfront forever. Rockefeller University, through Vice President Tim O'Connor, will be representing hospitals and research universities along the Esplanade on the board of Friends of the East River Esplanade, a nonprofit that I have designated as the conservancy to be the caretaker to our waterfront. Thank you to its founder and leader, Jennifer Ratner, as well as other volunteers for tabling today and your ongoing service.
coming into office, I knew the Parks Department projected a need to invest $115 million in repairing our esplanade to avoid having to spend $430 million to rebuild it. I worked hard to secure $35 million in funding in partnership with Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney as co-chairs of the East River Esplanade Task Force to repair and revitalize our space. I will continue to work with agencies to invest in our waterfront on piers that have fallen into disrepair and add in concessions that can generate revenue and most importantly, make our waterfront a destination. I have long advocated for service, ferry service along with Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Ferry service is yet another promise for my platform which, I will, be, which will be coming to the East River and Roosevelt Island by 2018 as announced by Mayor Bill de Blasio in his state of the city. We are taking back our waterfront so that it can become a center of transportation, commerce, and recreation once again. I'm also working to make streets safer. I support Vision Zero with the goal that no member of our community should ever lose their life in a preventable traffic collision. Pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists must all be able to use our streets safely. I used my first newsletter to ask 60,000 residents to share their knowledge of the most dangerous intersections and desired street fixes and improvements. I compiled information into a Livable Streets report and I'm now putting it into action. It's available for download at bencalos.com slash livable dash streets. In the past year, I've held three forums on street safety. During my campaign and once in office, I've had thousands of conversations, many concerning commercial bicyclists and a frustration that complaints have gone unheard. In response, I launched the Commercial Bike Safety Program to empower every resident to help improve safety for pedestrians concerned about delivery bikes. The program has a few easy steps. We canvassed every restaurant in the district and held a forum for over 100 of them where the Department of Transportation distributed free safety vests, bells, and lights. All three of them are required anytime you see a commercial cyclist. More safety vests. If you see or receive a bike delivery from a person with no safety vest displaying a business name and identification number, report it to the business 301 and to me. Report unsafe biking. If you see wrong way or unsafe biking, remember the business name, identification number from the safety vest, then report it to the store 311 and to me. The most important item here is your communication to the restaurant. The power of your dollars far outweighs the power of government to these stores. Enforcement. When you call 301, DOT and NYPD will be notified and will take appropriate steps to resolve the issue. The program has already had success in curbing unsafe behavior, spreading awareness, and increasing the use of safety vests. City bike and bike lanes are coming to our district in coming years. I'll work with residents and city agencies to ensure we have a voice in the locations and the implementation process so that it is as safe as possible. I hear a lot about the M79 and living at 80th in York, I experience it too. Recently, the M79 won the Pokey Award <laughs> for the slowest bus in the city by the Strathpangers campaign. I am working to make archival bus time, JPS information of these buses public so we can hold the MTA accountable. I also invested in bus clocks so you will be able to see when your bus is going to arrive and plan accordingly. We've all suffered through the construction of the Second Avenue subway and I've done my best to support businesses along the corridor through advocacy for funding in the budget to support as well as supporting them with my own dollars. If you're going out for a meal or ordering in, please shop Second Avenue. I'm proud to announce the 2nd Avenue subway is on track for completion on December 31st, 2016. <laughs> While we wait, I've authored legislation that would allow you to hail a New York City yellow or green cab easily on your phone. Since I proposed it, the idea has become so popular that the cities of Los Angeles and Chicago have already adopted it. I look forward to making it easier for everyone to hail a cab on their phone and get where they're going fast. You are my ears, you are my eyes, and we can only improve transportation if we work together. 
So please tell me locations that need improvements. And again, visit bencalos.com slash livable streets or just give me a call. We have some of the best schools in the city and as a graduate of the Bronx High School of Science, I am committed to a world-class public education. That clapping started with one of my fellow alumni. Uh, I've been trying to visit all 29 schools that I have in my district. Uh, some have even visited me. If I has, haven't visited your school yet, please contact my office, let me know. My goal is to support our principals, teachers, parents, and students providing resources and advocacy for what they need. Far too many children go hungry every day. That is why I helped lead the Lunch for Learning campaign to provide free school lunches to every student. We won free school lunch for middle schools. I will continue fight for all 1.1 million students to have a free salad bar, breakfast after the bell, and lunch. With hunger rampant throughout the city, I'm committed to making sure our city children grow up healthy from cradle to career with a fair chance at the American dream. Last year, I invested $1 million in science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, education, through my discretionary funds to improve our labs, computers, and equipment. Our children must be prepared for jobs in what has become a STEM-based economy. I learned how to code growing up, and it opened up a world of possibilities. Every child deserves that chance. Education is also about learning to be a good citizen. That is why I've made a special effort to connect our schools with our local democracy. This year, I pioneered a mock voting program for children at PS290, offered civics classes to schools in our district, and gave a summer reading challenge for dedicated students to read five or more books. I'm introducing a council member for a day essay contest for students grades five through eight. My young adult voter registration bill would guarantee that high school seniors get voter registration forms in their classrooms and at graduation and encourage them to register. But as they get older, students are being crushed under a mountain of debt. During my campaign, the New York Times endorsed my plan to create free CUNY right here in New York City. For every year a young graduate works and stays, they would be forgiven 10% of their loans. There's momentum for this idea. President Obama called for two years of free community college, and Governor Cuomo has called for low-income SUNY graduates to have loan payments covered for the first two years after graduation. We must, we must invest in students so they can power our city's economy. Instead of crushing debt, students deserve opportunity. And it's time to take New York City back for our tenants and residents. What if finding an affordable apartment wasn't impossible? What if rents didn't skyrocket every year? What if our seniors and our disabled residents didn't have to choose between medication and paying rent? Last year, I was proud to help lead a coalition that won a historic low 1% increase on one-year leases for rent-regulated apartments. I will keep fighting for a rent freeze in 2015. I was proud to fight side by side with tenants at Neckerbacher Plaza like Rita Popper and Harry Molise to protect former Mitchell Lama residents from being downsized to smaller apartments. The city heard our voices and now seniors are no longer being removed from one bedrooms and moved into two zero bedroom apartments. Recently, I introduced a bill to protect tenants from being placed on a blacklist simply for being named in a housing court proceeding. And last year, the city council successfully raised the maximum income for residents receiving senior citizen rent increase exemptions and disabled rent increase exemptions. And we must continue to develop responsibly once the Second Avenue subway is built. Any new building must contain affordable units. We must fix our zoning code so that tall skyscrapers for the few do not block light and air for the many. 
The future of our community depends on neighbors working together for responsible, community-driven development. Our district can only make progress if our city as a whole moves forward. Since taking office, I have made it a mission to move government out of the back rooms and into plain sight. As chair of the Committee on Governmental Operations and the City Council, I have fought to reform the most entrenched dysfunction. Though changing government takes time, just one year later, we have some results to report. The City Council passed rules reform to make it fair and accountable with legislation that will be online for you to do what you wish. I identified $4 billion in potential waste in contract overruns. I fought corruption at the Board of Elections, fighting for them to post jobs publicly instead of just using them as patronage, and won their adoption of a conflict of interest policy. I also successfully advocated for a transparent process for appointing three new commissioners who swore under oath to instate these key reforms. Finally, I passed... Finally, I passed four laws to improve transparency, efficiency, and participation in our city. The city record online bill will make public meetings and contracting notices available to you online instead of locked away in a file cabinet. Online voter guide bill saves the city millions of dollars by allowing the city to publish a voter guide online, which has already started this year. Agency-based voter registration will help New Yorkers participate by making it mandatory that more city agencies assist people in registering to vote. And an open law introduced by Councilmember Brad Lander, which I co-sponsored, will put the law online so you can actually see the laws by which you are governed without an expensive Lexus or Westlaw subscription. <laughs> when government is efficient, honest, and technologically sound, it is easier for residents to have a say, get help, and get ahead. I hope to see you again soon, far before next year's State of the District, at a First Friday, Policy Night, Mobile Hours, Been in Your Building, Cooking with Kalos, Street Fair, <laughs> Participatory Budgeting, Forum, Community Meeting, or Just Saying Hi, or Stopping By to Say Hello. One year ago, I promised to faithfully discharge the duties of council member to the best of my abilities. Today, I promise to continue to fight as hard as I can to make the changes we want to see in our streets, our neighborhoods, and in our city. But the state of our district depends on not just me, but on you, because together we can ensure it keeps getting better. Thank you.